it's after time to get started, so we're going to go ahead and uh, and get going here. People may be coming in and, and going out, but all of this will be recorded and put on the internet as well, so people can watch it later if they like. Uh, just follow along with me. If you're new to Darkroom Booth, uh, some of this may be completely new, but if you have uh, used Darkroom Booth for a while, you may also gain some new knowledge or something that you didn't know or didn't understand completely. So today's going to be more of an overview of the entire software. Uh, we'll cover more advanced topics in the future, uh, starting with this Thursday when we do a seminar on green screen. Uh, we hope we'll help a lot of people out. All right. Let's get started. If you look here at the software, uh, you'll see, first of all, the main screen. When you go into the software, you'll see the settings tab. Each tab at the top is broken down in different tabs to show you what section of the software you're working on at the time. Um, to the left of the settings tab, we have the prints tab and the photos tab. I'll explain more about those in just a minute. Beginning over in the left-hand corner, you'll see booth events with a little down arrow. Anytime you see a little down arrow like this right here, that means there's more there. So if you click on that, you'll see this drop down. Now you have create new event, duplicate event, edit event, etc. Darkroom Booth, unlike many other softwares out there for Photo Booth, includes image management and event management. Now this is a great thing to manage events. But sometimes people get themselves in trouble by going outside of Darkroom and deleting files, events, uh, images, things like that, that uh, they don't think they need any longer or something. And then when they go back into Darkroom, they get an error message or something. So it's best to always manage your events from within Darkroom. Now, there is no problem with leaving multiple events. Of course, every event takes up some storage space on your computer, but depending on how much storage space you have, multiple events don't cause any sort of drag or slowdown in the software uh, generally. So you can do that. You can leave your events in for a while. But uh, you know, to create a new event, you just click right here. This will start with a blank, totally new event that you can set up. Uh, you can put in their name. The description and notes tab are just for your own purpose and use. Uh, the next thing you can do is duplicate events. So let's say that you have an event that you have set up just like you want. All the settings are just like you want. Everything is just like you want, but you want to keep that event separate from another event. So what you can do is just choose duplicate event. When you do that, Darkroom creates a whole new event and adds one on the end of it with the same name. Now at that point, you can double click on it, and then you can change that name to you know Bob and Susie's wedding or anything else that you want to change it to to keep that one separate from everybody else's wedding. But that lets you start with a standard event. So if you have a standard event with all the settings that you like and you prefer for your event, you can start right there. Uh, another thing you can do, and this is the way you should do it, if you need to remove an event, if you no longer need an event, you've already exported the files as JPEGs, you don't need it any longer, you just want to remove it from your event, select Remove Event from Within Darkroom. This will remove it from the database and everything will work just fine. If you go outside of Darkroom and to do that, then it's going to cause problems with Darkroom because Darkroom can't find the files that it's looking for. So always remove and, uh, and everything from within Darkroom. Reset photo numbers uh, gives you an opportunity to set those numbers back to zero. So if you create a new event, then you want your image files to start with one, two, three. Instead of where they left off last time, you can reset those photo numbers and do all of that. Uh, refresh is just refreshes that uh, database. Uh, okay, I'm going to skip down and move on just a little bit. You'll also see when you do have these events that as I click on different events, this changes right here. Okay, this is the selected print template. So as I click on an event, it changes to a different one. The same thing is if I am in the screens tab, you'll see as I click on a different one, it changes. The reason for that is in image management, Darkroom keeps all of the settings that you created within that one event. The purpose for that is so you can pre-set up your events. Imagine if you have three events one weekend, uh, maybe all on the same day. You can pre-set those events all up and then just select the event and everything's ready to go. Whether you're switching from a 2 by 6 to a 4 by 6 you're changing screen files, you're changing print templates, it doesn't matter. All of those settings will stay with that event. 
so you can switch from one to the other easily with just a mouse click. So that's what uh, what all of that is for. You can just do that by clicking on a different event. All right, um, let's go back to the settings tab for just a minute. First and foremost, you want to set how many photos you're doing per session. Uh, I'm also going to mention a lot of things that we get common calls for during our support calls. A large percentage of our support calls, probably close to 70 to 80 percent, are involving things where people have set something incorrectly. Many times it's just something they overlooked, uh, simple that they just didn't select. So sometimes we'll get a support call where people say, oh, I'm, I'm only taking three photos. I've got a, uh, uh, you know, a session or a, a photo template set up for three photos, but it keeps taking a fourth photo. And that can be because you have the wrong number set here. So the number of photos here needs to match the number of openings in your print template. Uh, over on the right, you'll see how is the camera turned. We also get quite a few calls saying, what do I do if I want to use my camera vertically? Well, then you just select vertical, and that rotates the image automatically for you. The default is horizontal because that's what most people do, but you can rotate it vertically simply enough. Uh, print photo, this is where you choose your print size, 2 by 6 4 by 6 whatever, and you can also choose other and have a variety of sizes. These are common print sizes and photo strip sizes. Uh, two by six and four by six are by far the most common, um, so we uh, we have those at the top. You can also choose the number of copies. Now, keep in mind if you choose a four by six, it's going to set the default to one copy. You can change it. If you switch to two by six, it's going to switch the copies to two copies. There, are most asset printers, with the exception of a very few, uh, you know, special cases, most asset printers must do two copies of a 2 by 6 They cannot do a single 2 by 6 This is because die sub printers are actually printing a 4 by 6 and cutting it in half. So anytime you have a die sub printer um, like a, a DS40 or an RX1 or a Bravia or Symfonia, any of those die sub printers, and you're doing 2 by 6 strips, you can't do just one strip. Um, if you do, you're wasting ink because it's using a full enough to do two. So uh, that's why the default is set to uh, two copies. Now over on the right of that, you'll see the copies prompt. Uh, you can prompt before or after the session. This is an on-screen numeric keypad, one through nine, where you can allow the user to select the number of copies that they want to print. So if you do it before the session, when they start the session, the screen will pop up and say, how many copies do you want? They can choose one through nine, et cetera. Um, and that's you know that's up to you and your workflow. The default is no user prompt. Um, moving down the screen, post to Facebook. There's two different ways you can post to Facebook. We'll cover more of this in our next uh, week's webinar uh, on Facebook and social media and everything else. But basically, you can have two different ways of posting to Facebook. One of those is posting all to a single Facebook page. This is a page that you have credentials to. It could be a business page. It could be your page. It could be an event page that the bride and groom set up for the event or the commercial job that you set up for the event. Uh, you set that up in the global settings section. I'll show you in a little bit. But when you set that up and you log into that account and authorize your account, then uh, also new options will pop up here where you can choose what, uh, you know, whether you want to do it to the timeline or you want to post it to a gallery or what event page. So you have all those options there. You can also choose uh, what size you want to post. Most of the time for posting to Facebook, you wouldn't want to post a full-size image because it would be very large and take up a lot of that bandwidth for transmitting that image. And so you would probably want to choose a preview or a medium size. Um, if you look a little further down, you can also choose a different template. So one of the nice things about Darkroom Booth is we allow you for several outputs, including Facebook, to choose a different template that's going to get posted to Facebook from what's being printed. This allows you to format it. Let's say, for instance, if you're doing a 2 by 6 strip printed, you could format the, uh, the template for the Facebook upload to be more like a square with the images arranged in a grid pattern or something. So you can completely do a different template for your Facebook upload. Uh, at the bottom is also a watermark section where you could put proof across it or something if you wanted to as well. Um, you can also click on message and have the uh, you know the text put in the Facebook page, like you know thank you for coming to Marcy's wedding or something like that. 
uh, those are all options as well. The next two options down from Facebook are uh, photo email, one and two. You can have a darkroom prompt for an email address that it's going to send to. And if you choose that, you can do that. You can also have it post to a static email address. So if you just wanted to have it sent, every one of them sent to the bride and groom, automatically you could do that with photo email two and then have it prompt for photo email one in the first one. Um, you choose the default or the uh, account that you're going to send with. We'll talk about that more in the next webinar, but basically you want to have uh, the account that you're going to send with be the account you want the emails to come from. So that would be your, you know, whatever account you plan to use, your uh, business account or maybe your vendor if you're doing an event for a corporate vendor, they may want it to come from their email address. That's all information there. To have it prompt, you just choose prompt. At the end of the session, it would pop up an on-screen prompt saying, would you like to have this photo emailed to you? They can type in their email address and the emails are retained. Uh, so that you can export those later. You can also, again, just like Facebook, choose the size and add a different template if you wanted to uh, have that output to a different template. And you can do that twice. Uh, you know, there's two setups for that, photo email one and two, um, just in case you want to send it to two different addresses. You can prompt for one and you can have a set that one as well. A uh, little known fact, when you are doing the email prompt, you can just type more than one email address if you want that email to be sent to more than one person. So if there's three people in the booth and they all three want to get an email, uh, they can just type comma another email address, comma another email address, and have it all sent to the same to the to all those people. Okay, uh, new feature in Darkroom Booth Two. We'll cover more in the next webinar, but uh, I'll touch on it a little bit here. This is the photo to phone. This is where you send a uh, image to your phone or to someone's phone. Uh, you can do that two different ways. One of those is with a service called Twilio. Twilio is not a free service. They do charge, I believe it's a penny per uh, text message. Uh, the advantage of Twilio is that it comes from a phone number. So when the person receives the image, it's coming from a phone number that's associated with your business. Um, they can also, if you just leave this blank and don't use Twilio, but you set up an email account, uh, it can be sent as an email. The person sending with email, they would just put in their phone number and choose their carrier because each carrier is slightly different in the way that gets sent out. Um, so they would you know, put in their phone number, choose AT&T uh, or Sprint or whatever carrier they're using. The uh, carrier list is editable. So if there are carriers in the default list that are not in your area or some carrier in your area that is uh, uh, not in our list, you can add it. So it is editable. Just like all the outputs, you can choose a different template if you want it to be formatted for the phone so that it looks better on a viewing, on a photo, on a phone screen rather than uh, what gets printed. So you can choose a different one there as well. You can also click on this button right here, message, and you can put in whatever message you'd like them to receive when they receive that. So, you know, thank you for coming to the wedding or whatever ever the information you want to go with that. Okay, down one more, we have Save Output 1 and 2. The purpose of Save Output 1 and 2 is to save the images as a strip. So whatever is sent to the printer can also be saved as a JPEG image. Uh, actually, you can choose several different image formats. You choose it, you can choose the location where it's going to be saved. You can also choose uh, the file type. JPEG is the default, but there are a number of other formats you could choose if you wanted to and the quality level as well as the image size, uh, full size versus preview size, etc. cetera. Um, all of these options are to allow you to save those images out to a folder in real time. Using the save image output, it's saved after every session. So at the end of the night, they're already saved out. Um, there's two of them, so you can do two different sizes, two different templates, two different you know output options there. So you can do that any way you'd like. The last option down here is one that a lot of people don't completely understand. It's copy originals. Now what that does is it takes the original photos from the camera and it copies them out to another location and also allows you to change the size. So you uh, set up the location, the file size, format, just like you did before, choose the, the uh, image size. But the last option down here, output with template, lets you also add a template if you're doing green screen 
uh, or do you want to have your logo on all of those images in the corner, something like that, you can create a separate template that's tailored to what you want it to look like. And you can also save it to the same folder. Now, if you're doing a slideshow, then you can save the originals and use one of the save it, uh, output one and two options to save both photo strips and originals to the same folder. And they won't conflict with each other, but that would allow you to include both originals and uh, photo strips in the slideshow if you wanted to. Um, so you can create a separate template there to include along with that. Uh, we'll cover more on that with the green screen uh, later on this week when I do that uh, in more detail, but you can also add a green screen template there. Okay, now back up here at the top, we already talked about the copies, but the next one is post the Dropbox. So if you have a live internet connection at your, um, your venue, you can check Dropbox and you can set up a Dropbox account and after every session, the image will be copied to Dropbox and saved. This is a great way to deliver to your customer if you have an internet connection. You can just say, hey, at the end of the night, all the images are on Dropbox and they, uh, they can get them from there. Uh, just send them an email with the Dropbox link. But just like all the others, you can choose the size and the template if you want to add a separate template to those as well. Uh, a little bit further over, here's the second way you can post to Facebook. This first way that we talked about right here, post to Facebook, that's to a specific page that you have credentials for. That happens in the background. The person doesn't have to do anything after their session. It just automatically gets sent to that Facebook page. But if you check this box, user post, uh, then it will prompt them at the end of the session, just like an email or a text message, it will prompt them if they want to upload to Facebook. Now. They just click on that and um, put in their username and password, and it will let them post it to their own Facebook page. Uh, those uh, passwords are not retained, so that they don't have to worry about security or anything there. Uh, the other thing is with Facebook and with Twilio and with Post to Dropbox, you do need a live internet connection. With text, with, uh, phone, photo to phone, using email, or just general email, you can do that without an internet connection and they'll be queued up and sent later. But Facebook and those, they have to have a live internet connection because they don't allow us to queue those up for later. Very last option on this page, you'll see where it says view email addresses. We get a lot of calls for this after an event. People will say, hey, I want to see those view, those email addresses. Is there anything else it's saved? And it is saved. You just click on view email addresses and it will pop up a, uh, in this case, I don't have I don't have any yet, I haven't done it yet, but it would pull up an option to give you either a Excel spreadsheet where it has the email address and the photos that were sent to that email address, or just a text uh, list of the email addresses only. You can use that for marketing purposes or to look back and see who got what photo and things like that. Okay? Now then I'm going to move on to the next one. This is our screens tab. The screens tab is where you will choose, edit, create a screen. And uh, you can see down below, this is the selected screen. As I change events, you'll see that the screen changes, okay? So we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Um, in fact, let's edit one just a little bit right now. This is a screen editor. When you click on edit screen, it opens the screen editor. Along the bottom are all of the icons to choose what you're going to do. Over here, we have a preview setup. Anytime you see a gray box with a number in it, that's a preview, okay? Uh, over here, we have a live view window, gray box with live view written in it, and then we have countdown. That's a placeholder. Darker Booth uses placeholders for text. You can put static text if you want to, if you want to have, you know, hard code in there or hard type, uh, you know, Bob and Marcy's wedding or welcome to the event or or whatever you want to do, you can do that. But if you use placeholders, then you can use your screens in a more generic way only changing the text tab to customize what that screen says. So if you see percent text percent or percent countdown, then that is a placeholder for that item. So in this case, any text in the text tab is going to be entered in this space here. The countdown is going to be entered here. Now if you double click on that, uh, you can change the color, the font, bold, all sorts of things about the way that looks. Uh, so if you want it larger or a different color that's easier to see, you can change that there. 
On the right hand side, you'll see different buttons. If you're using a touch screen, uh, the buttons on the touch screen uh, don't have to have any coordinates or anything typed in. You can just create a button. These buttons were all created within our software. I'll show you how to do that in just a few minutes. But if you double click on one, uh, you'll see all the different options there. You can change the color, the size, you can change lots of different things, including the booth command. So real quickly, I'm going to just create a whole nother button. So if I click on Add Shape, I can choose whatever shape I want that button to be. In this case, I'm going to choose a heart. And so you can look down and see all the different options. Now, I think a heart ought to be red, so I'm going to choose red. Now we're going to have a red heart. And I want this booth command to be, uh, let's choose start booth, real simple, okay. So start session. I'm going to click OK. And uh, then I can click on text. And I can just add start. Oops, there we go, start. And I can change the size and you know whatever I need it to be. In this case, it's going to be white. So now when I click OK, you'll see that I have a start button. I can resize it. I can move it anywhere on the screen. And when they touch that button, it will execute that command. So just double clicking on it, you can see the start session is what's going to happen under booth command. You can also um, click and add a sound effect. Okay, So you can click and add whatever sound effect if you wanted that button to make a noise when you touched it, a beep, a bonk a horn honk, whatever you want it to do. And if you're using a fidget, we'll talk about more about fidgets later, but if you're using a fidget, you can select a fidget uh, device to add, uh, to turn a light on or something there if you wanted to. Okay, I'm going to just remove that for now. Um, so we've got a copies button, we've got a color and a black and white button. Another thing you can do with any element on the screen if you look here, there's this when shown attribute, okay? When shown, the default is always, but you can click on custom in the drop down, choose custom, and then just check the box when you want that element to show. Now, the advantage there is you can use that in a lot of ways. You can, uh, for example, a start button wouldn't have any function after the session has already started. So, in that case, you would just uncheck before photo one and on because you don't need that start button to show anymore. The next thing you could do is like for instance a copies button, you only need that to show at the end. So you just uncheck everything except the end instructions and then at the end the copies button will show. So you can use that for a variety of things to show different uh, elements on the screen when you want them to. Um, back over here on this side we have the edit screen button. This lets you choose the template size, horizontal, vertical, et cetera. So if you're designing on your desktop computer to use on your booth computer, and your booth computer uses a vertical screen, then you can just select vertical and choose your template size. When you create a new template, booth will always default to the current monitor that you're using on the computer. But if your booth computer has a different monitor resolution uh, than what you're designing on, you can choose that. While we're on that topic, let me add this one. Um, side thing there that the uh, the trial version will allow you to use the editor in it to save templates uh, and then when you transfer those templates to your booth computer that's activated the watermark goes away so you don't have to use an activated version of the software to do your design work on you can have that on your computer at home or your desktop or give it to a designer so they can do your designs for you and then you just transfer those to the booth uh, you can also choose a background color in this case, this one's got a nice bluish purple, but I could just uh, click and change that to brown. Uh, click OK, and you know, suddenly I've got a, a different color background altogether. So uh, that's all in the Edit Screen dialog. We can just choose whatever color we wanted that to be. All right. Now then, uh, Edit Item. That's just a shortcut key. So if you have, in this case, this text item selected, I can select edit item and open the properties bottom box for that. You can also just double click on the actual item. Uh, add photo and add photos. Those are two different things. Um, if you want to add previews in a nice neat array, if you look here, this is all one piece. I can move all four of those together. They're all lined up and spaced evenly. So you use the add photos button for that. 
that lets you specify the number of rows, the number of columns, etc. And you can just put all that information in. So, for instance, if I'm going to change that to two and the number of columns to two, then I would end up with four like this. Okay, you can also undo that. Uh, if you add photo by adding just a single photo, then you can drag that around, move it anywhere on the screen, resize it independently, have the photo scattered around the screen if you wanted to. So add photo lets you add them independently. Add photos lets you add them in a nice even line if you wanted to do that. I'm going to remove that to get it off my screen for right now. Uh, add text. You just click on add text and you can uh, type in any text you want. You can choose any font on your computer. Darkroom Booth uses the font on your computer. So if you want more fonts, add more fonts in Windows. Darkroom Booth uses that. Uh, you can choose the color, the size, whatever color you want it to be. Uh, choose the font, alignment. You can add drop shadows, lots of options there. So you can see there, this is my text. You can also resize that box and increase the size of your font if you want to as well. So that's how you can add static text. Okay. If you want to add special text, let's say you want the text to be different uh, on the start screen than you do on the end screen. Then you insert special text and you can see all the possible text fields you can enter. Ready text can be different than uh, video text or in text. So you just choose the text if you want. If you just have a generic text box, then all text will go in that same box. So that just depends on your screen design. Add artwork is uh, the next icon there to the right and that allows you to add uh, images logos, graphics, whatever you want to add, and you can um, choose uh, to, uh, to add those. Let's, uh, let's add one real fast. If I want to add, a, let's say, a graphic for a button, okay? So there, there's a, a PNG graphic. I can resize it, move it anywhere on the screen. And it also has all the same sound effects, booth commands, and device control as well. Okay, I'm going to remove that for right now. Now then, uh, add shape. We've already talked about the add shape that you could use for buttons. There's a variety of shapes that you can choose and create your own shapes that you can use for buttons within, so you don't have to find a graphic to use those. Um, add effect. Add effect is... Uh, it is a, a little known feature that you can do in Darkroom that allows you to choose all sorts of different effects to get different things. You know, like for instance, if you know all the images are going to be black and white, you could choose grayscale. Uh, if you, uh, you want to make just some color adjustments and make them brighter or, or saturated or something like that, you can do that. So you can just choose the option you want. And when you choose it, it's going to add it to the whole screen, but it's all resizable. So, for instance, if you wanted half the screen to be black and white and half the screen to be color, then you could just cover half of the screen and it will just be black and white on one half. So you can arrange that effect over just the area of the screen that you want it to be on. Now, there's a wide array of effects. We'll do another webinar later on on more details about that. Uh, but you can play with those and see what effects you'd like to add to your screen or print templates in that way. Uh, add live view. Add, this one already has a live view. It will only let you have one live view on a uh, template. If you don't have a live view screen, this is one option you could do. If you just don't have a live view screen, then the live view will appear in this uh, preview opening. And then we'll go to the next one and then go to the next one. So the live view will, once it's taken, it'll go to a static image and then the live view will move to the next one. Uh, or you can have a live view here. The live view can be resized any way you'd like. You can also crop that live view. So if you move it in like this and change it from the default size, then that will crop the image. So if you wanted it to be square or your camera's a rectangle, you could do that. Many times we get support calls from people saying, my print doesn't you know, match up with my live view. Well, that's because you've got them shaped differently. You want to make sure that your live view and your print template match in aspect ratio. So if you got a square in one, you want a square in the other one. 
Um, let's do that. Um, add a line is just a simple area that you can add a line, you know, to that. Uh, add barcode. You can add barcodes, QR codes. Uh, if you wanted to have someone be able to click on screen or on the print, either one with their phone using it like a scanner to take them to a website or something, you can add a QR code to do that. You can also insert, you know, things like the file name, uh, the date and time and stuff like that inside that QR code. So you can use that as well. Across the top, we have all sorts of, uh, you know, things people sometimes call and say, hey, I've got you know, how do I get two things the same size on the screen? Is it just trial and error moving them around? Well, no, you can actually select those two things and then just click on make same size and position and dark room will match them two exactly. Uh, over on the far right here, we have our template items list. A template items uh, is not a static list. It's something that you can adjust. Think of it as layers in Photoshop. So you can move things up and down in the hierarchy of the uh, the templates so you can see how in that case the color when it's on top of the black and white I can move that around and change that so you can use that uh, to move things up and down now the top right here I'm, I know I'm going fast folks but we are running low on time in the top you'll see uh, show all that's also adjustable to show you so you can go to what part of the session so you can see only the part of the session what's going to be showing on the screen when you're ready for that part of the session so that you don't have all these confusing elements on at once. So if you've got things set to show at different times, you can click on the before uh, photo four, before photo three. Just go to whatever part of the session you want to see and find that what the screen will look like during that session. I want to cancel that um, and move on. The next one's the controls tab. These are the things that uh, allow you to control the booth. We get a lot of support calls, people saying, how do I reprint? Where's all the shortcut keys? Well, they're all listed right here. Uh, control B will change it to black and white, control C, et cetera. So you can make uh, toggles that way with your keyboard if you want to. Control R reprints the last one. Control R asks you for copies. Pops up that on the screen template. Our keypad that you can choose the number, or in this case, you would choose it with your keyboard if you wanted to. Uh, so different options there. Uh, you always want to have a way to get out of booth mode, uh, you know, so you want to make sure that either escape is checked or there's some other area that you can touch or something, a hidden button or something. Uh, if you're using a touch screen without a keyboard, you could, uh, you know, program it to click on the bottom left corner or something if you wanted to, to get out of booth mode. But that's something that you always need to do. Uh, you can also choose to set up a mouse uh, so that the mouse button do a command. So these are all the different commands that you can choose to add to a mouse button. Now, one critical thing you want to make sure you do is if you're using a touch screen, you do not want to have uh, anything assigned to the left mouse button. Windows will always interpret any touch on the screen to be a left mouse button. That's just Windows. So if you have anything set to the left mouse button, Sometimes we'll get a phone call from people that say, oh, no, it's just randomly printing. I don't know why. It's just randomly printing. Well, that's because they have the left mouse button set to reprint. And when they do that, then every time anyone brushes against the screen and touches it or touches anywhere on the screen other than a defined button, it's going to start a reprint. So anytime you're using a touch screen, you want to set the left mouse button to not used. You can use the middle and right mouse button. Those are less of a problem because to use, for instance, Windows interprets a touch and a hold to give you a right mouse button. So you'd have to touch it and hold it for a certain length of time before it would react. But with the left mouse button, it does it as soon as you touch it. Uh, here, the next one down here is hide mouse cursor. You probably don't want to see the mouse cursor in your booth mode. So that's the default if you did for whatever reason for testing don't have a, test, a touch screen attached or something, you can uncheck that and see your mouse button. Uh, down below in the other section, we have a few other options that people can use, face detection uh, for starting the, the event. Um, not necessarily the great thing it might sound like, because anytime anyone looks at the camera, it's going to automatically start the session. Uh, sometimes we have people call and say, oh no, my booth is starting a session all by itself, but we don't know what's wrong, and it's because they have face detection for starting checked, and uh, that will start at any time anyone looks at the camera. 
Uh, the next option down, face detection, print uh, copies for each person, actually works really well. Now it does, uh, let me give you a little clue on the logic here, it counts the number of faces and prints out a copy for each face. But if you're doing a two by six strip, it's going to have to round that up to make sure it you know, stays within that, you know, the print uh, printer can only do two copies. So if you have uh, five people in the booth, you're going to get six strips. Another thing that you need to keep in mind is if someone has their back turned to the camera, their face is not seen. If they're behind someone, if there's a large group in the, in the photo, like if there's six or eight people and they get behind someone and most of their face is obscured or they're wearing a mask. So there are ways that can be fooled and cause people to not be able to see uh, their, or the uh, space detection to detect their face and print out a copy for them. And in those situations, you could just hit Control R to print another copy if you wanted to. But otherwise, face detection works pretty well. Uh, voice detection, uh, if you have a microphone available, you could set it up to where they have to say a certain code word uh, like marriage or uh, Audi or you know whatever event you're doing, you could use a code word. Works pretty well, uh, but in noisy environments, it might be a little bit more of a problem. Uh, serial port trigger, if you're using a touch screen, you probably wouldn't be using that. That's an older way of connecting arcade buttons to your computer if you wanted to do that. Some older booths that are being retrofitted with our software need that. The very last option down here, require operator PIN code to exit booth. If you have a keyboard available to all of your guests, they could easily hit escape or that some other method that, you know, however you have it set to exit booth mode. You might want to check that option, but pay attention. When you do check that option, what's going to happen is when someone hits that escape or anything else to get out of booth mode, it's going to ask them for their code to exit. We get a lot of phone calls from people saying, what's wrong? It's now suddenly requiring a code for me to get out of booth mode, and it's because you checked that option. The default code is four zeros, zero, 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 zero. You can change it to whatever you'd like, but just be aware that if you check that, you will need to remember that PIN code to exit booth mode. Uh, let's move over to the text tab. This is where I was talking about the placeholders, where you can put in whatever text you want to show up in that percent text percent or percent in text, those kind of things. So you can type it here, and it will be reflected in the screen file without having to change anything. Down at the bottom, there's also uh, you know the uh, modifiable text for phone entry, things like that. If you want to change the wording, that's fine. It's especially important for people in other countries that want their guests to see it in their own language so they can uh, change that, those prompts and things as well. Uh, down at the bottom, enable survey mode. This is a new feature for Booth 2. This is a survey or quiz system where they can, you know, you can pose questions, you can ask people, you know, how many uh, cars do you own or something like that, or what kind of car do you own, things, and those are also retained. We'll do a, uh, a more in-depth um, webinar on uh, survey quiz at a future date, but just realize that Booth 2 does have the option of doing a survey or a quiz uh, before a session. Okay, back up at the top under the timing tab, these are all the timing settings that you can set to suit yourself however you like your Booth session to run. Um, we see a lot of tech calls with people that have problems with their countdown not finishing and it's, you know, our countdown is, is hanging up and things like that. And many times it's because they didn't pay attention to their countdown timings. So I'm going to briefly explain what all these timings mean. The first one is the get ready to lay. That is an extra time that you can add before the first photo. So uh, that's when it would display like the get ready and then start the countdown. The advantage to that is, especially if you're using the live view set to only be on during the session, because if you have it set to only on during the session, the live view for most SLRs takes a couple of seconds to enable. That's just the camera itself it takes that long to turn it on. So you might need to give a little extra time before the first photo to allow people to get into position after they press the start button and the live view comes on. So you can adjust that to give them more time to get ready before the first photo. Then of course we have the countdown timer, three, two, one picture. Um, and you can uh, have a countdown before each photo or just uh, no countdown at all or uh, before only the first photo, that's up to you. Uh, between photos, that's the total time between one picture and the next picture. You wanna keep the between photos time about the same or equal to the countdown timer and uh, not have a, you know, a, a, a 
six second countdown with a three second time in between. So that gives people time to have that get ready, all that display. After last photo, that's important if you're going to be using the retake feature of Darkroom Booth 2 so that they have time uh, to uh, decide, yeah, I like that one. No, I don't. Let's retake it. So you can adjust those timings there. Uh, end instructions, that's that very final end instructions where it might say something like, your photos are printing, you can step out of the booth now. Uh, you want that to be long enough so that people don't just hit the button again and do it again to get out, but at the same time, you don't want it too long so the next people that get in the booth aren't sitting there waiting for that to go away. So that's something that you'd want to uh, play with and see what works best for you. Uh, before video time is the next one, and that would be the delay before a recording starts. You can have it start automatically at the end of that delay, or you can also require them to click another button in order to get the video to start. Uh, this would be similar to the get ready delay so that they can get ready and make sure they're lined up and looking good in the camera. Uh, maximum video time, that's the length of time that you're going to allow the video session to be. It doesn't have to be that long. They, you can put a stop button or end button, cancel button, but that also uh, sets the maximum time that they can record. Uh, after video is uh, a time that, uh, you know, again, just like the uh, end instruction, you can say, okay, we're done, you can get out of the booth. The last three options are delays for different um, uh, on-screen prompts, like the email delay, the email entry. So at the end of the booth, when someone selects they want to send their email, the email delay is how long they get that option, yes or no. So you, you know. You might want to set that shorter. Uh, 60 seconds is quite a while if they decide not to do it and just get out of the booth and don't ever answer anything. The next person getting in, you don't want that to still be on the screen. So you can adjust that email delay. Email entry is the keyboard, the on-screen keyboard. So once they choose yes, the on-screen keyboard comes up. At that point, they may say, eh, never mind. So you don't want to leave that on screen for two minutes. You can adjust that however long you want it to be on. Uh, the copies delay, the very last one, is the same thing as the uh, the others, just how long that uh, print copies, uh, how many copies do you want, would remain. In your cameras and everything, but also for choosing and setting up and doing troubleshooting with your camera. So if you go here. Uh, you can choose, first of all, when you want that live view on after the session has started or always on. That's up to you. You can do it either way. It's completely up to you and your choices. The next option is when a photo is captured. Now, if you're using an SLR, uh, specifically Canon, is, is specific to this, but it affects others as well, you want to pause the live view to capture the photo for two reasons. Most of those cameras cannot focus while in live view and they cannot trigger a flash while in live view. So to be able to do those things, the live view has to be shut off for a brief second. Um, and, uh, and also, if you do that, you can set that length of time here, but that will also display the photo from the uh, actual taken photo in the live view window for that many seconds. So if you want them to see the photo after it's taken and see what it looks like, then you can set that up to where, it, just by adding time here, how long that's up there. Uh, this is also just a second place where you can set that horizontal and vertical. If you change it here, it will change in the other place as well. To the right of that, you'll see the mirror yes or no. Most people find it more uh, comfortable to see themselves in a mirrored view like they're used to seeing themselves in the mirror at home. So you check yes, that's the default. Everything would be backwards. So signs, anything with text on it are going to appear backwards just like they would if they were looking in a mirror. Most people don't have a problem with that, um, but if for whatever reason you didn't want it that way, you could just check the box, uh, no, and change that. Um, if you're using a Canon camera specifically, you probably want to have the external flash compensation checked if you're using manual exposure. I'll give you an example real quick. Uh, here we have it checked, and you can see my lovely model. Don't laugh. She works cheap. Um, but we've got it on a green screen, and if I uncheck that, when that goes back, you can still see it. That's because I'm in program mode. It's adjusting the exposure automatically. But I'm going to switch the camera over to manual mode now. 
so that that uh, manual exposure. And let's see what my exposure is here. Manual F8. Okay. Anyway, if your live view is dark, you want to check that box. We get a lot of tech calls from people saying, you know, my live view is too dark, I can't see it. So you want to check that box, and that will make your live view bright. Okay, let's move on. Camera tab. This is where you can set all of your camera options. Um, now, a little qualifier here. This particular one right here is a physical dial on the camera, so we can't make that dial turn on its own. So you'd have to set that manual program, etc. For the purpose of a photo booth, you probably either want to use manual if you're using external flash or program. Uh, you can also use time value or aperture value. All of these specialty modes, in many cases with many cameras, lock out live view features. So for instance, if you put a Canon camera in the sports mode or the nighttime mode or the green mode or something like that, then it will tell you the live view won't work and that's a restriction on the camera. So if you use manual or program, that's the P, uh, or any of those standard modes, then the live view will work. So you want to make sure you have that set there. You can choose the uh, aperture, the ISO, the file size. We recommend a small file size just because it transfers faster. Some of these cameras today, even their smallest file size is really large and you're only printing a two inch you know, wide strip. So uh, you don't need to take the full size photo for that purpose. Um, in many cases, these options will change depending on what camera brand and model you're using. Some cameras don't have all the same options. So uh, if, you, if this looks different than what you're used to seeing, it's because you're using a different camera. This is a T3i that I have connected right now. Once you get all these set, you can click on Save Settings, and it will save those settings for you. Then when you get back in the booth, if you have Auto Restore and you plug that camera in, it bases it on the serial number of the camera, it will restore those settings for you automatically so that you don't have to worry about that. Um, so that's what that particular setting is for there. Uh, manage Settings just lets you look and see what each setting for each camera, if you have more than one. Um, <clears throat> a darkroom booth is different from a lot of other softwares in that we make one version of our software that works with both Canon, Nikon, and well, uh, and webcams as well. So you don't have to buy several versions or a different version for a different kind of camera. You can just plug it in. We detect what kind of camera you plugged in, and we make it work. So uh, that's there. The wrap-up tab is a new feature in uh, Darkroom Booth 2. It lets you define where you're going to copy the originals, copy the, uh, the photo strip outputs, and also survey results and things. So that if you want to, at the end of the night, you can have all these things predefined, plug in a thumb drive, and just click Generate Selected, and it will generate all those and copy them straight to a thumb drive for you. You can just preset that up so that it's all ready for you. Um, I'm going to spend just a few minutes before we run out of time on the global settings section. Don't panic. We're going to spend a lot more time in future webinars on more detailed areas because it's hard to cover a lot of things in an hour. But if we go to the darkroom um, global settings section, very first thing, application options. This is where everything is stored, okay? Um, there's been a lot of misinformation out on Facebook about the X drive. The X drive is not magic. The X drive is not anything special. We're not repetitioning your hard drive or anything else. It is simply a shortcut that we make available to this physical location. This is the default physical location on your computer. If you were to open Windows Explorer and browse to that location, you'd see all of your files and events. Again, never ever delete anything from that folder. That's a bad idea. But if you have a, a dual hard drive system or something in your computer and you're running out of space on your first hard drive and you want to move all this to your other hard drive, you can change that location here. Uh, just be sure and copy all of those things from the original location to the new location. We get a lot of calls where people say, you know, suddenly all my events are gone and all my uh, templates are gone and everything. And that's because you changed this location and didn't copy those over to the new location. So if you do change this, it's best to leave it alone. But if you have a good reason to change it, be aware that you need to copy all the data from that first location to the new location. Uh, application updates. You'll see here the current version, 
that I'm using uh, is, a, is a pre release. It's version 2.00404. That's the version you're on. So when you call support and they say, what version you're on? The reason we're asking that is because many times it may have already been fixed, but you're on an older version and you didn't, didn't know that. Um, so you can uh, just tell us right there. Just go to Global Settings, Application Updates, and it'll tell you what version you're on. Um, it says here this application is already up to date. We make a new va a release available on our website. You'll see that update, and you can click there and download it and install it. The next option down we'll spend more time on next week, but that is uh, device control. That's the, the fidget relay control. You'll be able to turn on electrical devices like lights and things like that. We'll spend a lot more time on that next week. Uh, email and social media, you can set up your email accounts and things here. You can have multiple email accounts and use different email accounts for each uh, event if you want to. Um, this information is the send account, and this is information you would get from your provider. So if your provider is Gmail, your provider is uh, you know, Hotmail or one of these others, uh, or GoDaddy or something, you would get that information from them. Uh, be aware that most of the free services, Gmail, Hotmail, so on, they limit the number of emails you can send and they also require additional setup information on their login panel that you have to set up to be able to use an external software uh, with their email account. So those are things you need to set up in advance. Uh, you can also test that before you go to an event. If you click on Add Account, you'll see that you can add a Dropbox account, Facebook account, uh, and also Twilio if you're using Twilio. So those are options there where you can add more accounts here as well. All right. One thing I want to cover that generates a lot of support calls is printer. How do I set up my printer? Okay. If you're using one of the printers that Darkroom has built in, it's really pretty simple. You just choose the printer you're using, like for instance the DS40. Click Add. You can pretty much leave all the defaults and uh, just select OK. <coughs> now, in my particular case, I don't have one plugged in. Otherwise, it would say Detected right here. Now, you see that I have Enabled. That means that I, I, I want to use this prayer. So if I double click on it, you'll see all my different options here that you can choose. If the printer were connected, it would tell me right here how much paper I have remaining, things like that. And you can also choose what print sizes are allowed uh, there and adjust the color and different things. Um, primarily, this first screen is, any, is everything you would need. But with most built-in drivers, you just select it and it works. Now, uh, if you wanted to use more than one printer, let's say you have two DS40s and you want to use them both so that you can uh, speed up print times or something, then you can plug them both in and have them both enabled. All right? So Darkroom will automatically load balance between the two printers. So just plug it in, make sure they're both enabled. However, if you only have one printer, only have it enabled. I have seen some people generate uh, you know, tech calls where they'll have maybe two or three printers. Uh, they own two or three printers. Let's say they own a Brava, and uh, they'll set that Brava up. And uh, they also have a DS40. But on this job, they're using the DS40. So they have it set up with both of them enabled over here. When they get to the job, for some reason, they're not getting all their prints. Only half of them are printing out. And that's because Darkroom is trying to load balance to a printer that's not there. So you want to either delete it or disable it by unchecking that box. So you only want printers enabled if they're physically actually connected to your computer. Now, with built-in drivers, uh, if you switch between 2 by 6 and 4 by 6 Darkroom will handle that automatically. You don't have to do anything. However, if you're using a Windows driver, that's another matter altogether. Uh, with a Windows driver, you click Add Printer. And uh, for those of you that are using printers that are not in this list, you can use those. Just install the Windows driver. Then you'll click Add Printer. Darkroom will open a new list of uh, items that you have installed on your computer. I'm going to choose Bravia. This is uh, the uh, Windows driver for the Bravia, and I'm going to click OK. So now it'll have a little Windows flag beside it to let me know it's a Windows driver, and I've got the Bravia connected. Uh, now, the, the thing you also want to do when you have that all set up is realize that the page size needs to match the actual thing you're printing, not 2 by 6 4 by 6 because it's being sent to the printer as a 4 by 6 and then it's being cut. So you want to keep that in mind. That should always be 4 by 6 or whatever the, the large
largest print size six by eight. Doing that uh, most of the time four by six. That's the default. Um, then if you click on properties, that will open the actual. Uh, Uh, Windows driver, and then in that Windows driver, you can uh, use that to, uh, because of the way this webinar works, I won't show you that window. Uh, but anyway, if you click on this properties button, that will open the actual Windows driver where you'll set 2x6 versus 4x6 cut. So that's, people call all the time and say, how do I switch from 2x6 to 4x6? That's how. You go to the, the global settings section, printer options, double click on your printer, Click on the properties and then set it there. Okay. All right. Um, the last option down here under system info is uh, basically this is information for us to use for tech support in many ways. You can uh, activate and deactivate your computer there. It also tells us more information about your computer, what the CPU you have, also if you're using any antivirus software or anything like that. Um, I hope everybody got something out of this. We'll try to spend some more time in the next few webinars on more detailed information about things um, you know, in each one of those categories so that you'll have more information about those. Uh, you know, for instance, the front tab and the photos tab, these are all you know where you can see your photos. You can print your photos and things. Um, I'll give you a quick rundown of something, a preview of what I'll be spending more time on with the green screen. Uh, here's three photos that I did with green screen. One is just using, uh, this one is using uh, the on-camera flash. You can see it's pretty harsh and has a very dark shadow at the bottom. This one is just using the room light. I'm in our typical office with a four by two foot uh, fluorescent panel above and that's all the light that's provided. This is what a really good quality green screen photo should be. Uh, it has a uh, nice even green. You don't see any of the wrinkles that you see in this photo. It's also not dark in the corners. You can see how this one gets a little dark in some areas. Um, it also doesn't have any harsh shadows behind it. Now then I'm going to jump out of that and go to the print tab so you can see what the corresponding dropouts look like. There's the one with the on-camera flash. This is the one with the room light which because it has less shadows and less harsh light, softer light, it's a little bit better. But then if you look at the one that's lit properly, you have a good even, you know, green screen dropout. You don't see a lot of, uh, you know, shadows and artifacts and things like that, like you do in this one um, that's with the on-camera light. Okay. We'll do more of that uh, on Thursday when we do the, uh, the green screen and how you can adjust that more. A uh, couple of last minute things I wanted to touch on. Uh, if you call for tech support, many times we get emails and phone calls from people that they don't, they really don't know anything about their own setup. It's very helpful if you know your uh, version of Windows, whether you're on Windows 7 or you're on Windows 8 um, and then all of that. It's also helpful and needs to call up if you uh, know what version of Darkroom you're on. So you can click on global settings, application updates, and see what version number you're on. Uh, the last thing that really helps a lot in, uh, in, in the, uh, the setup, if you know what camera and printer you're using. Many times we receive emails from people that say, I'm, you know, I'm having problems with printing, but they don't tell us what printer it is. And that just means we have to ask, and that takes extra time. So if you could provide us with the information about your hardware, what version of Windows you're using, uh, and what version of Darkroom Boost you're using. That speeds things up quite a bit. Uh, also, to make things go easy at your event, it's also a good idea to have the, the version that you're using on a thumb drive, Darkroom Boost on a thumb drive, so you can reinstall it if you need to. It's also a good idea to keep your codes handy so you don't lose those codes. Um, we take calls all the time from people who don't have any idea what their code is and they're wanting to put it on a new computer. So keep the code handy so you can reuse that. Uh, things like that make a big difference in how quickly you can set something up or how quickly you can take care of troubleshooting problems. Some other things that you may want to keep at an event with you are spare cables. Uh, USB cables are pretty inexpensive. You can buy them in quantity on Amazon.com for three or four dollars each usually. 
So have a few of those. They can go bad um, sometimes without warning and break. Hubs are the same way if you're using a tablet, which requires you to use a hub. Keep a, a hub handy for that purpose, and, uh, and that will make your, your events go a lot smoother. I hope you uh, enjoyed the webinar. We'll get back to you in a few days with another one uh, on Thursday, focusing on green screen only. I hope you'll enjoy that. And then the next week we'll be doing one about uh, Finch at Facebook and uh, video. So I hope you had a great day and uh, good day.